Um, I just want to thank all those who made the webinar possible. There's a lot of work that goes into making something like this happen. And the speakers you have today have a lot of information to offer. And I'm really honored to be asked to be part of this presentation. As Nikki said, I was asked to do a welcome. And usually there, it involves a prayer. But um, I don't pray in the sense that others do. So what I do is I talk to the ancestors and ask them to give me guidance on how to proceed and, and how to make sure the future of our children and grandchildren are protected. These days, I feel an intense anxiety to do more. And just as we try to get rid of viruses that make our bodies sick, we are now the virus that needs to be eradicated. And it seems that Mother Earth is doing her best to get rid of us. And that comes in the way of this crazy weather and storms and corona and other viruses, heat waves and floods. Mother Earth is talking to us and we need to listen. And many know that the indigenous ways dictate how to live our lives to make sure that seven generations ahead have a healthy environment to sustain them. At the rate we are going now, I worry that even three generations ahead will have a very difficult time. So it's very important to get to the tipping point to make others aware of how destructive our way of life is. Resource extraction of all kinds is the starting point for everything pollution and climate change brings. So later my talk uh, will focus on how communities are affected with the Mount Polys of this world, but it is important to remember that there are many kinds of communities and as humans, we are destroying their environments. We protect ourselves by having filtered water, air conditioned homes, cars and offices. In this way, we don't feel the full effect of what we are doing. We are killing many species of birds, animals, plants and fish. They don't have the natural air conditioner they need anymore. They don't have filtered water. They are forced to live in the polluted water that humans create. And we have to remember when we talk of communities that it is not just humans we are talking about. We need to keep other communities front and center in order for us to survive. Without them, we become extinct because what they need, we need. So the most important role that I have today is being a grandmother. And so I ask the ancestors to help all of us process what we learn and help to educate others about the changes needed. Before the pandemic, our children and grandchildren were in the streets fighting for their future, and we need to help them. We have to fight for all of our grandchildren, even the grandchildren of those polluting the earth, because those grandchildren also have the right to a healthy, sustainable future, even if their ancestors don't take that into consideration. We have a lot of work to do, and I thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks so much for that, Bev. Uh, my name is Nikki Skews, and I'm with the Northern Confluence Initiative uh, based here in Smithers, British Columbia on Wet'suwet'en territory. Um, we appreciate this opportunity to have a number of, of industry, government, NGO, community, indigenous, and other representatives uh, joining us to look into best practices for mine waste storage and to also take a bit of a deeper dive into how BC measures up in comparison and some reforms that uh, community groups and, and First Nations are asking for. So for the next hour, we'll hear from, we'll hear six presentations um, and then we'll have a question and answer period um, following for about the last 20 minutes to half an hour. So for those attending, um, please, uh, I'm sure most people are familiar with Zoom, but there's a Q&A button there um, at the bottom and we encourage you to um, ask questions as the presentations are going and we'll be collating those and uh, hopefully getting to as many as possible for a discussion towards the end. So without further ado, um, we'll start off by hearing from Bev Sellers again. She was the chief of the Hutzel Band at the time of the Mount Polly disaster. She's also the former chair of the First Nations Women Advocating for Responsible Mining and an advisor to the Indigenous Leadership Initiative, as well as an award-winning author 
whose books you should all read. So we'll pass it on to you both. Thanks. I think, you know, it's important. I mean, we could get into mining right away and uh, the Mount Polys of the world, but I think it's important to understand how we got to this point and how it has affected our communities. Um, first of all, before the newcomers came to this land, the indigenous peoples lived by the natural laws of the land. Indigenous peoples groomed the lands and water so that they could, could continue to harvest the vast richness that Mother Earth offered. The indigenous economy walked and grew on the land and swam in the waters. Our ancestors were healthy because they lived in harmony with nature. The view the indigenous people had was demonstrated to me years ago from an elder. And he said that everything inside a circle, everything is connected and humans are equal to everything living, even the rocks. So you don't have a prominent place, you're equal to everything. And that differs from the opposing way of looking at things where there's a triangle and humans are at the top and are dominant over everything else. And that way of thinking has gotten us into the mess we're in today. I always like to quote um, Joe Martin from the Tleokwiat uh, tribe and he says, Mother Earth will provide for your needs, but not your greed. So in the area of Ma where Mount Polly is around Quinell Lake and Horsefly, there are traditional pit houses everywhere. In the middle of Quinell Lake is Caribou Island and it is full of pit houses. Our people lived in the entire area of the Seguetan Nation for Seguetan Territory for thousands of years. We have everything from inland rainforests, deserts, and everything in between to provide us with all of our needs. So at one time, our community of Hatsult was supposed to get an Indian reserve at Quinell Lake, but I won't get into that now. The point is that even though racist, land, racist laws were imposed by the newcomers to keep us from our territories, indigenous people never ceded our lands to anyone. Unfortunately, millions of our people died off from the diseases brought by the newcomers and that weakened our fight for our way of life. In 2007, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was adopted. And it amazes me that we had to fight for this to have it adopted. To me, it is no different than black people having to fight for the right to be free. Now that may seem harsh, but if you read through UNDRIP, the UNDRIP document, the right in there are basic human rights for any group and only require common sense. So in the early 1970s, the indigenous people along the Fraser River saw changes in the salmon that concerned us. And we tried to warn the Department of Fisheries and Oceans about the changes, but they said it was normal. Indigenous people have depended upon their intimate knowledge of the environment for thousands of years, and we knew it wasn't normal. You know, and I wonder, often wonder whether if they'd listen to us, if we would be in the situation we're in today. BC and Canada had the perfect opportunity to change ancient mining laws in 2014 when the Mount Polly disaster happened. And I won't get into the technical details of the disaster. There are more qualified speakers that you'll hear from today. What I want to concentrate on is where the disaster has left our communities. I don't mean just the indigenous communities, but communities such as the Quinell Lake residents and everyone who relies on the Fraser River watershed. It includes communities on the ocean where salmon from the interior visit for a few years before going home to spawn. Never has a phrase, we are all in this together, fit so perfectly. Everything is connected. The Fraser River watershed is being used as a garbage dump for industry. The cumulative effect comes into play. Every natural law is being broken and the evidence is overwhelming and everywhere. Those who harvest from the waters and the lands are seeing, along with the changes in fish quality and quantity, we're seeing changes in wildlife, evidence of liver and organ damage in wildlife. 
Moose populations are way down. Birds are disappearing. The changes in Quenelle Lake that only started with the disaster, and again, they claim, oh, it's climate change, not from the mine. But, you know, it doesn't take a science degree to know that these are not normal. So now many people have ceased processing fish from the Fraser River. I personally have not eaten fish from there for probably about 20 years. The cancer rates are going up and many are looking suspiciously to the salmon and the wildlife as possible causes. And for what? So people can collect so-called precious metals like gold and save it for future security. Common sense goes out the window when money is involved. People hoarding gold, diamonds, or whatever to survive in times of need are in reality helping to destroy the very economy, the real economy that they're going to need to survive, and that's food and clean water. I'm not going to um, get into the details of UNDRIP because I only have 10 minutes. I just want to focus on something that is mentioned a number of times in the document, and that is called free prior and informed consent, or FPIC, that is, as it is commonly known. FPIC is a principle protected by international human rights standards that state all peoples have the right to self-determination. And linked to the right to self-determination, all peoples have the right to freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. FPIC is backed by some of the most powerful and comprehensive international instruments that recognize the plights of Indigenous peoples and the instruments defend our rights. The most important component of that is clean water and land. Canada and BC have adopted UNDRIP and in doing so, agree to FPIC and yet as Indigenous peoples, we are still fighting to protect our waters and lands. In addition, governments are ignoring their own laws in the many Supreme Court of Canada decisions Indigenous people have won. But thankfully, many people are realizing the importance of the way of life of Indigenous people and are supporting us. I believe everyone should be pushing for the immediate implementation of UNDRIP to protect themselves, no matter what nationality you belong to. Resource extraction companies use smoke and mirrors to justify their destruction of the environment. Their claims are that they provide jobs, but they don't mention that they're short-term jobs. They remind people that all the materials used in phones or other gadgets are mined, but convenience is our downfall. They claim to provide stimulus to the economy, but they fail to mention that once a mine is in existence, it will be there forever. Many still destroying the real economy, the water and land, all of the chemicals leaking still forever. Many people are unaware of the damages to the environment because they live in cities or towns far from the resource extraction activity and get everything they need from the stores. As long as it is on the shelves, they don't worry about what it takes to get there. Out of sight, out of mind, just as Indian reserves and indigenous people were at one time. <clears throat> And it's said that it's said, been said many times that up to 90% of gold is used for jewelry. So for the vanity of humans, we are destroying the earth. In this time of examining human injustices, we have to include the environment and the way racism plays a role there. There has to be a major shakeup of the way things are done. Not only do we need to look at the human rights movement, but also the atrocities committed against the environment. Shortcuts to resource extraction need to be eliminated, and the Toronto Stock Exchange should not dictate when mining is done. I firmly believe that we are being slowly killed by resource extraction, and by not saying anything or helping to change things, we are committing slow suicide. Mount Polly and other resource extraction companies need to be held to a very high standard. Otherwise, the message to all others who are polluting is full speed ahead. 
There's a lot more I'd like to say, but as I said, I only have 10 minutes and there's other people that have a lot of important information. So I'll leave it to, uh, at that for now. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks so much, Bev, for that. Next, we'll hear from Stephen Emmerman from Malach Consulting and also from Jan Morell from Earthworks. And they'll be presenting the guidelines for responsible mine tailings management. This was a, a document signed by 150 organizations and technical experts. So we'll pass it on to Stephen first. Stephen, are you there? Stephen? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, there you are. Thank you okay. so much. Okay, sorry. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Stephen Ammerman. Uh, I'm the owner of Malach Consulting, and uh, I'll be presenting with Jan Morell uh, from Earthworks, and we'll be talking about the recent publication called Safety First, Guidelines for Responsible Mine Tailings Management. Uh, this will be a uh, layperson's guide. Um, I understand there's many mining professionals on this webinar, which is fantastic. So uh, I'd be very happy to answer any technical questions you have uh, during the Q&A period. Okay, so let's begin. Okay, so first of all, what are tailings dams? To start with, mine tailings are the crushed rock particles that remain after the mineral of value has been removed. And typically these mine tailings are permanently stored behind a dam that's constructed out of mine waste. Okay, so what can go wrong? Uh, the worst that can happen is the catastrophic failure of the tailing dam with the elimination of uh, tens of or hundreds of millions of cubic meters of toxic tailings into the environment. And these catastrophic failures have resulted in destruction of habitat, uh, destruction of property, um, and, and loss of human lives. Okay. Um, I had the great honor of uh, visiting the site of the Mount Polly tailing dam disaster. Uh, in the company of indigenous leaders, uh, and this was uh, four years after the disaster had occurred. Okay, so safety first, what is this? This is an ultra conservative document, okay? Now in the area of dam engineering, the word conservative means protective of people, property, and the environment. Someone could argue that a certain standard is too conservative, but anyway, that's what conservative means. Our approach has been to take the existing guidance documents in tailing stamps and to choose the most conservative options among all of those documents. Okay, so let's see how this was put into practice. Okay, first of all, guideline one, make safety the guiding principle in design, construction, operation, and closure. The ultimate goal of tailings management must be zero harm to people and the environment and zero tolerance for human fatalities. Guideline two, ban new tailings facilities immediately upstream from inhabited areas. Now this kind of legislation has been passed in Brazil and Ecuador and in China um, in the previous year. Uh, for example, here is the legislation from the state of Minas Gerais in Brazil. Um, they say that uh, you cannot build a tailings uh, facility when there's a community downstream that could be reached by the flood of mine tailings within 30 minutes. Okay, this is a good start. Uh, we ask, can really every member of a community, elderly, disabled, small children, can they really be evacuated within 30 minutes? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Okay, um, so our argument is that these minimum distances need to be defined on a case-by-case -case basis. If a tailings flood could reach a downstream community in two hours, but it would realistically take three hours to evacuate the entire community, uh, the tailings facility should be regarded as a no-go. Now, in order to discuss the remaining guidelines, I need to give a little technical background for the lay people. 
okay? So we have here an example of a conventional tailing storage facility in British Columbia. There's a pipe that comes from the ore processing plant that has the mine tailings and a lot of water. And out of these spigots, the tailings are hydraulically injected um, in the upstream direction. Um, the smaller particles will settle close to the dam crest to form a beach. The smaller particles and a lot of water will be carried farther from the dam crest to uh, form a settling pond. Important features here is that there's a lot of water mixed with the tailings and the tailings are not compacted in any way. They're simply hydraulically injected. Okay, now the problem is that this kind of facility is highly susceptible to failure by liquefaction. Okay, so what does that mean? If we look at the left-hand side diagram, we see uh, solid tailings particles are very loosely packed, but they touch each other. So the solids are supporting the load. Okay, now suppose we have a disturbance, like an earthquake, uh, blasting, uh, even heavy rainfall. Um, now we move to the right-hand diagram. We have a disturbance, the solids settle, but it happens so fast that the water can't escape between the particles. So the water simply becomes pressurized and it holds the particles apart. Since the solids no longer touch each other, the whole mixture behaves like a liquid. And this liquefaction, this has been promoted by loose packing, that is a lack of compaction, and the spaces, the pores between the tailings being saturated with water. Okay, now very, very influential um, analysis by the expert panel on the Mount Pauley disaster. Um, that expert panel report um, stated three requirements for the current best available technology. One, eliminate surface water from the impoundment. Two, promote unsaturated conditions in the tailings with drainage provisions. And three, achieve dilettante conditions. Now, dilettante conditions means that the mass of tailings is so dense that when you disturb it, it will expand and not contract, okay? That is, you can't liquefy because it's already dense, okay? So to achieve these dilettante conditions throughout the tailings deposit by compaction of the tailings, okay? Again, according to that report, filter tailings technology embodies all three best available technology components. In filtered tailings, the tailings have less than 25% water content. They don't behave like a slurry, but more like a, a, a wet soil. And the good thing about the lower water content is the tailings can be compacted inside the tailing storage facility. Okay, uh, one last technical interlude. What's called the upstream construction method for tailings dams. Okay, now these kinds of dams are inexpensive because they use a minimum amount of construction material. Basically what you do, they do, is you construct the dam on top of the soft uncompacted tailings. It means that these kinds of dams are very susceptible to failure by liquefaction because the soft tailings can liquefy and the dam simply falls down and backwards into the liquefied tailings. Tailings dams at the Recent disasters, Mount Pauly, Samarco, Brumaginio, those were all upstream dams. Mount Pauly Dam was supposed to be a centerline dam. It was converted to an upstream dam in violation of permits. I'll say more about this later. Uh, currently, upstream dams are prohibited in four Latin American countries. Uh, this will lead to guideline three, that is ban upstream dams and new facilities and close existing upstream facilities. Uh, based on what I just said, this would seem to be um, a no-brainer. Um, there is another point of view, um, and that is that um, upstream dams can be constructed safely if you have ideal conditions, that is low precipitation, low, low um, seismicity, and if your team doesn't make any mistakes. Okay, this classic paper talked about 10 commandments for upstream dams and said so you can't violate the single one of those commandments. Now, the modern practice in high-risk industries, that is aviation, pipelines, et cetera, is to not have a list of commandments that cannot be violated, but to use multiple backups, multiple redundancies, essentially make systems idiot-proof. And uh, based on this modern practice, um, the time for upstream dams has passed. Okay, guideline four. 
Any potential loss of life is an extreme event and design must respond accordingly. Okay, we say that if there's potential loss of life in the event of dam failure, the dam should be designed to withstand the probable maximum flood and the maximum credible earthquake. Okay, these are the most extreme events for flooding or earthquakes that are even theoretically possible at a given location. And in this respect, we are following the guidelines for dam safety from Federal Emergency Management Agency. Okay, guideline five. Mandate the use of best available technology for tailings, in particular filter tailings. Okay, now there is a practice of um, using a water cover, as we see in this diagram, uh, to prevent acid mine drainage. And we are saying that can no longer be regarded as a best practice. Same thing was said in the Mount Polly report. It can quickly be recognized that water covers run counter to the best available technology principles. The Mount Polly failure shows why physical stability must remain foremost and cannot be compromised. Guideline six, implement rigorous controls for safety. If there's potential loss of life in the event of dam failure, the annual probability of failure should be less than 0.001%. Otherwise, the absolute minimum annual probability of failure should be 0.01%. And in this respect, we are following recommendations of Federal Emergency Management Agency and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Okay, uh, further requirements on the slope of the outer embankment. Uh, we are following recommendations of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in saying that embankments should be no steeper than one meter vertical for five meters horizontal. Um, just for um, an alarming counterexample, uh, this is a photo I, I took um, of a tailings dam under construction in Ecuador that's being constructed at a 45 degree angle, which is usually regarded as the point of collapse. Okay, guideline seven. Evaluate and characterize the dam foundation and the tailings and estimate their relationship uh, to risk, okay? So we are arguing that acid mine drainage has such a large potential for vast environmental damage that if the tailings have significant potential for acid generation, again, the tailings dam should be designed to withstand the probable maximum flood and the maximum credible earthquake that is failure of the tailings dam should be essentially impossible. Okay, guideline eight. Appropriate monitoring systems must be in place to identify and mitigate risk. Now, um, important part of this is that almost all mining projects, really almost all large scale engineering projects rely upon what's called the observational method. Okay, this says that all actions cannot be planned in advance but as the project proceeds, op observations will be made, and then choices will be made from a set of pre-planned actions or contingency plans. And the emphasis here is pre-planned actions. Um, this was abused at the Mount Polly mine. There was a shortage of waste rock for dam construction, and the construction method was switched from center line to upstream, and the outer embankment was steepened from one vertical to two horizontal, to one vertical to 1.4 horizontal, um, and this was simply a, as a way of saving construction material. Okay, now in Poly report, the observational method is useless without a way to respond to the observations. Our version, the observational method is not simply a license to figure things out later. Okay, guideline nine, ensure the independence of reviewers to promote safety. Um, the Mount Polly report did not um, initiate the idea of independent tailings review boards. They certainly promoted this idea. Uh, we are emphasizing um, the need for true independence of tailings reviewers. Okay, and uh, guideline seven, towards zero failure after mine closure. Okay, now after the secession of a mining project, the tailings facility should still be reviewed, inspected, monitored, and maintained until that facility has reached a state of safe closure. Until the facility is in a state of safe closure, the mining company cannot walk away from the tailings facility. Now we define a state of safe closure as ability to withstand without failure the probable maximum flood and the maximum credible earthquake 
with the ability to remain in that state indefinitely with no further inspection, monitoring, or maintenance. That is, you don't walk away from the tailings facility until failure has become essentially impossible, even without further supervision. Uh, and in this respect, we are following guidelines from Australian National Commission on Large Dams. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Jan. Thank you, Stephen. So Stephen just walked us through the guidelines in the Safety First document that were closely related to risk and safety. And I am going to cover the guidelines that are more closely related to um, respect for affected communities and corporate accountability. So starting with guideline 11, we require that all communities, both affected communities and, and um, potentially affected communities provide consent for every stage of the tailings facility. This consent must be free of manipulation, coercion, and extortion, and it must be carried out in a linguistically and culturally appropriate manner. This consent could also include um, no-go zones that are defined by indigenous peoples or affected communities. And so the guidelines acknowledge that there may be certain areas where a tailings facility or tailings dam should never be built, no matter how the dam is designed, monitored, or operated. Um, the guidelines also highlight that for Indigenous peoples, international law recognizes that EFIC must be in place. And thank you to Bev for uh, the context that she provided to us at the beginning of the webinar on this, on this topic. Next slide, please. Guideline number 12 in the Safety First document covers grievance procedures and whistleblower protections. Um, so the Safety First guidelines say, that grievance procedures must be available to employees, contractors, suppliers, regular, regulators, as well as indigenous groups and rights holders. So that would include affected community members. And we drew from the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, Principle 31, for how those procedures should be uh, structured and carried out. We also require in our, in our guidelines that the grievance procedures be administered through an independent mechanism that is not embedded in the mining company itself. We also require whistleblower protections are available not only to workers, but vendors and contractors and auditors. And we drew from Brazilian mining law and included that mine workers must be allowed to stop their tasks on the mining site at any time if they identify safety risks and that must be able to happen without punishment. Next slide, please. Guideline 13 looks at emergency preparedness and response. So we drew for this guideline from UN guidance on um, preparedness on emer for emergencies at local levels. And our guidelines require that emergency preparedness and response plans be developed and prepared together with downstream communities as well as mine workers and in collaboration with first responders and government agencies. These plans must also include modeling and drills for worst case failure scenarios. And a worst case failure scenario is a, a situation where 100% of the tailings are released from the storage facility during a, a, a failure or um, a catastrophic event. Um, and an example of that would be the Church Rock uranium tailing spill in New Mexico. It happened at that, at that site. Um, in the case of a, of a catastrophic failure of a tailings dam, the mining company is, must be responsible for taking all necessary steps to save human lives and protect um, communities and provide appropriate aid. Um, and they must also provide resources to local governments to make sure that they are able to save communities and protect lives as well. Um, and then guideline 14 states that any information regarding mine safety must be pub made publicly available at no charge as soon as possible in the languages necessary for people to be able to access it. Um, and this should include raw data as part of environmental monitoring, not just a summary um, of the final outcome. Next slide, please. And then finally, we have two guidelines related to corporate accountability. The first guideline addresses financial risk. So the Safety First document says that mining companies must have financial assurance to cover the full cost of closure and post-closure for all new and existing mines. Um, this financial assurance must be liquid, reliable, and independently guaranteed. And it must be in place during the permitting process 
and the financial assurance should transfer with the sale um, of the mine or the tailings facility to another company or operator. The guidelines also require mining companies to have public liability insurance that will cover the economic, social, and environmental damages from either acute or chronic failures at the tailings dams. So slow releases over time or, or sudden catastrophic failures. Um, the safety first guidelines say that companies should not use corporate guarantees or be allowed to self-bond or self-insure. And then finally, we drew from the Mount Poly expert panel and said in the safety first guidelines that safety risks are not separate from financial risks. It is important that mining companies are able to purchase and use the safest technologies and they need to demonstrate that they've considered all the technical, environmental, social, and economic risks associated with that site. And then to finish up, the last guideline is guideline 16, says the ultimate responsibility for tailings facilities should rest with the board of directors. And because the, the board of directors is the entity charged with overseeing the entire mining operations, they should be held responsible in the case of um, tailings failures or tailings accidents. So with that, I will wrap up our presentation on the Safety First Guidelines. Steve and I will be happy to answer questions in the Q&A at the end. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Stephen and Jan, for that overview. Um, and now, uh, just a reminder, if uh, folks aren't used to the webinar format versus meetings, there is that Q&A button down below if you have questions that come up. And you know, quick answers will be responded to by some folks helping out. And, uh, and otherwise, we'll get to those in the discussion. So next, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Chambers. He's the founder and president of the Center for Science and Public Participation, as well as an engineering and geoscience background, and um, has helped uh, co-author the, um, the guidelines that we just heard about. And he's also dug deeper a little bit into how BC measures up to those and um, how, how far we've come with those Mount Poly expert recommendations. So pass it over to you, Dave. Thank you, Nikki. Um, so I was asked to look at how the safety first recommendations are or are not met by existing regulatory structure in British Columbia. Um, I would like to focus on those guidelines that BC does not address, just because that's probably where the most important need for change lies. But time permitting, uh, I would like to talk about those BC guidance regulations that partially meet or even fully meet the safety first guidelines. Regulation of mining in BC uh, basically follows three components, three guidelines. The first is the BC Mines Act, which is legislative guidance. Out of that Mines Act comes uh, the regulatory code, which are the regulations themselves. And then uh, to, in order to implement those regulations or code, uh, there's also a guidance document. So that, that body forms the, the written background upon which BC regulates mines. So now uh, looking at the guidelines themselves uh, and starting with those guidelines that I don't believe are being met at all, uh, the first guideline is make safety the guiding principle in design, construction, and operation and closure. BC does place a strong emphasis on physical stability in its guidance, but it doesn't carry this through to the risk assessment process, which is where tailings dams are essentially classified. Uh, in the risk assessment process, safety is only one of several factors to be considered. And it's therefore assumed that engineers and risk assessors will automatically make safety first. Uh, I think we've seen that in practice, if you put safety on a co-equal level with cost, for instance, which is another one of the considerations, uh, cost will generally dominate the decision making. 
Guidelines two and three were ban new tailings facilities immediately upstream from inhabited areas and ban upstream dams. Uh, BC does not address either one of these issues. Guideline number seven, uh, meaningful engagement, participation, and consent of all affected communities must be obtained for any tailings facility. BC guidance does require consultation, but it doesn't specify how this consultation is to take place. This leaves a lot of room for interpretation. And in addition, it's important to note that consultation is not consent. So uh, I think there's a lot to be done yet in order to meet the uh, guideline. Guideline number 12 was uh, to develop independent grievance procedures and whistleblower protection. The Mines Act, uh, does have does address employee right to refuse work, but that's focused on worker safety and, and prohibiting discrimination. The Mines Act doesn't really address grievance procedures or whistleblower procedures. Guideline 14, uh, information regarding mine safety must be made publicly available. BC is required to make annual dam inspection reports available, but it's not clear that other safety reports or safety data are similarly available to the public. Guideline 15, which is operating companies must have the necessary financial assurance to cover the full cost of closure and post-closure plans BC does require a financial surety for reclamation. However, the amount of that security is left to the discretion of the chief inspector. And this has led to a very significant level of underbonding or underprotecting in British Columbia. The other part of that uh, recommendation, guideline 15, was that operating companies must have public liability insurance to cover tailings dam failures. There's no requirement in British Columbia for accident liability insurance. Uh, and in fact, this requirement does not exist or is not enforced anywhere else in the world. Uh, uh, so although BC doesn't do it, they're not alone in that regard. Guideline 15 was uh, accountability resting with the board of directors. BC has no specific requirement with regard to boards of directors. Uh, BC does uh, state in its guidance that it tries to follow the recommendations of the Mining Association of Canada. However, MAC uh, guidance requires the designation of an accountable executive but it only specifies that the role and accountability of the board of directors or governance level versus the accountable executive officer is to be determined by the owner and should be documented. So that's a very loose requirement. This essentially means that accountability is left with this accountable executive while the board of directors retains the authority for spending on dam safety. And I would argue that anytime you separate accountability and authority, that often leads to problems. I want to touch uh, on just two of the guidelines that I believe are partially met by BC. Uh, one of those is uh, guideline number four, which said that Tailings dam failure potential loss of life requires a dam to be designated to withstand the most extreme meteorological and seismic events. That is uh, the maximum credible earthquake and the maximum probable flood. BC and its dam designations follows the 2013 Canadian Dam Association classifications. And there are five levels there. Extreme, very high, high, significant, and low. Uh, 
BC requires only those extreme events be used in the design of dams that are classified as extreme. And other dam classifications from very high down to low do not have to be engineered for those maximum events. But it's important to recognize that in, for instance, the very high category, you could have up to 100 potential fatalities associated with a failure. And yet that particular dam would not necessarily require design for maximum events, which is why the uh, safety first guidelines said uh, any human fatality should be associated with uh, maximum design event. I think it's also important uh, when we look at recommendations that come out of these technical organizations like uh, the Canadian Dam Association or the Mining Association of Canada, those are recommendations that are essentially being made by engineers and they're just recommendations. There's no uh, hard and fast or black and white uh, technical or, or data requirement that drives those. And I would argue that those classifications really should come from another source, you know, the, a source uh, like the government or like the safety first, because those recommendations come from the affected parties uh, as opposed to the technical designers. The other uh, guideline that's partially met that I'd like to touch on is uh, number nine, to ensure independence of reviewers to promote safety. Um, independent tailings review boards must be approved by the chief inspector of mines in BC, but independent isn't defined by BC code or in the guidance document. So the interpretation of this, of who is independent is left entirely to the discretion of the chief inspector. Uh, I think we really do need a definition of independent to guide the chief inspector. Uh, otherwise, it's just totally left to that person's discretion as to what independent means. So I think I'll, uh, I'll stop there. Uh, again, I'm willing to uh, discuss any of the recommendations and their, how their uh, application uh, fits in BC, but uh, that gives you a bit of a flavor of major points. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. David Chambers. Um, next, we're going to hear from Alan Adzerza. Alan is uh, currently leading mining reform discussions with the government of British Columbia on behalf of the First Nations Energy and Mining Council. He's also a Taltan and an artist. I'm not sure if any of those pieces behind you are, are your own works, Alan, but <laughs> um, so we'll pass it on to, to Alan. So thank you, Nikki. Um, I'd like to begin by um, thanking the organizers for inviting me to participate, and it's an honor to do so. Um, as Vicky says, I'm tall tan, but I wanted to let you know that I am Togodana, it's a wolf clan of the Taltan Nation. Nikki asked me to talk about mining reform priorities for the First Nation Energy and Mining Council. So that's kind of where I'm gonna go with my presentation. I'd like to start by saying that I worked at the Ferro Mine in Yukon for eight years. I worked in the mill, I worked in the open pit, and so I think I have a pretty good understanding of the mining process. I'm currently working with another group to restore placer mine sites in the Klondike Goldfield in an effort to restore salmon habitat, spawning habitat in, uh, in the Dawson City area. As Nikki points out, I am leading the mining reform discussions with the province on behalf of the BC First Nations Energy and Mining Council. 
The Energy and Mining Council is a mandated provincial not-for-profit organization that advocates and facilitates on behalf of First Nations as they strive to manage and develop energy and mineral resources in a way that protect and sustain the environment forever while enhancing social, cultural, and economic well-being of our people in BC. The Energy and Mining Council reports to the First Nation Leadership Council and is accountable to the BC Chiefs in Assembly. BC First Nations have inherent rights and title, which have been confirmed in the Supreme Court of Canada on many occasions. Simply put, we have ownership and authority over our lands and resources. We are a government. We are not a stakeholder. The courts have stressed that at a minimum, First Nations must be consulted and accommodated where projects go ahead. The UN Declaration says the minimum standard is free prior informed consent for projects to proceed. Simply talking to us without receiving our consent to proceed will inevitably lead to more court decisions against resource projects of all kinds. And we are witnessing this today with the proposed Trans Mountain Pipeline and LNG Pipeline projects. In 2012, the Ross River Dena Council went to court and received a court decision that states that Crown constitutional duties of consultation and accommodation must occur before Crown mineral claims are issued and consultation and potentially compensation must take place before issuing approvals for exploration work. I'd like to point out that because of that decision, the Casca lands in Yukon are currently under a moratorium and no staking is allowed. Simply talking to us about um, consultation today is not adequate. Everything now requires, in our view, consent. In 2019, the province of BC, um, in their throne speech, committed to true and lasting reconciliation with Indigenous people, including making sure they are full participants in decision-making that affect their rights and lands. In November of 2019, the province proclaimed the Declaration Act. This act was co-developed with First Nation Leadership Council and other Indigenous organizations. I'd like to echo Bev's comment that this is a piece of human rights legislation. I recently made a comment to a friend of mine that public government in Canada is, is um, losing public confidence. And I, was, and I was asked, why do you think that? This is an important question. I responded, the analysis by the First Nation Energy and Mining Council of 35 tailings dams finding concluded that BC First Nations communities are on the front line of mining negative environmental impacts, including disasters, polluted rivers, toxic waste sites, and degraded land and air quality. And potentially, 33 First Nation communities, along with 8,000 kilometers of streams, rivers, and lakes, and an additional 208 communities and settlements could be directly impacted, some of those in the U.S. and the United States. There are many public reports that highlight issues and concerns, such as Sparwood Town needed to be temporarily should um, town wells needed to be temporarily shut down due to high selenium contamination. That the Elk Valley fish population was being affected by selenium contamination. That the Chief Inspector of Mines report concluded that 
financial security deposits for restoration of mine sites were undersecured by more than $1.2 billion. Canada taxpayers are on the hook since there are, is no means to hold the polluter accountable. That Red Crest mine is the same tailing design as Mount Polly, but three times bigger, with potential to do much more environmental damage than Mount Polly if there is a beat, if there is a breach. The Tulsaqua chief mine that went bankrupt has been leaching environmental contaminations for over 60 years. That the federal government recently approved $2 billion to begin addressing mine rest restoration of historical projects approved under their jurisdiction several years ago, such as the Ferro Mine, the Ketha Mine, and the, and the uh, Giant Yellowknife Mine in the Indian WT. It is critically important for the general public to become more aware and to begin to hold their public representatives accountable. As Bev said, we are be committing suicide by being silent. I participated in a dialogue with the Natural Resource Canada initiative regarding the updating of the Canadian Mines and Metals Plan last year. And information provided to the participants included charts that demonstrate Canada is falling in the ratings for countries for preference for mining. So where are we at? The 2014 Mount, Mount Polly disaster opened up a dialogue between First Nations leadership and the, and the BC government on mining law and mining reform. Mining dialogue that we've undertaken involves primarily uh, our first priority is the Mineral Tenure Act. This act is a non-discretionary system that needs to be replaced with a discretionary system. We need to implement First Nations free prior informed consent prior to granting legal interest in lands and resources. We need to talk about the establishment of standards for mining, such as IRMA. We need to talk about the establishment of non-refundable hard financial assurances, such as cash, bonds, insurance, etc., be put in place within the first three years of mine operations. Need consideration for independent monitor compliance enforcement consistent with the 2016 Auditor General Report due to regulatory capture. Need to in consider incorporating a process to ensure First Nation guardians have a role in the monitor compliance enforcement function. We need to emphasize the need to clean up existing contaminated sites, especially those that are under government's care and maintenance due to corporations going bankrupt without proper closure. We need to talk about the establishment of a super fund for future catastrophes such as Mount Polly. The mining plaster sector needs to be a regulated industry. Currently, it, we view it as not being regulated. And the larger projects need to go through an environmental assessment process like any other mining activity. Cumulative, imp, cumulative impacts needs to be considered and we need to remove the exemptions that have been put in place. We are talking about minerals on reserve, the mining code and environmental assessment. The environmental assessment for sure can play a role in First Nations leading those assessments. All of, this, all of these activities are a serious threat to our salmon. The wild salmon are an important part of our culture and livelihoods and uh, of BC and they are threatened by mining projects. Wild salmon stocks are under serious threat on BC coast in part due to sea-based farm climate change, overfishing and impact to spawning habitat. 
the slide at Big Bar demonstrates how migrations will be impacted for several years to come. In concluding my remarks, I would like to focus on the Pending Mines Amendment Act, known as Bill 6. This act was unilaterally drafted and introduced by the Minister of Mines. It is not consistent with the Declaration Act. Bill 6 fails to address the Ministry of Energy and Mines conflicting dual role as a, as a promoter of exploration and mining on one hand and as a regulator on the other. First Nations guardians in monitoring compliance enforcement could serve as a showpiece for the Declaration Act. These legislative amendments, such as Bill 6 during a global pandemic, being unilaterally done by the government is not honorable, especially since most First Nation offices were closed during the pandemic. With that, I'd like to thank you for listening. Adieu. Thank you so much, Alan, for sharing that. Um, the last speaker that we're going to hear from is Deborah Curran. She's uh, the Executive Director of the Environmental Law Center at the University of Victoria, uh, as well as an Associate Professor there who focuses a lot on watershed and municipal law. So we'll pass it over to you and I'll just share my screen. Great. Thanks very much, Nikki. And hello, everyone. I'm speaking to you from Wasanich Territory on the southeast coast of Vancouver Island. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Environmental Law Centre is the oldest public interest environmental law clinic in Canada. And the purpose is to train the next generation of public interest environmental lawyers in Canada and to provide legal capacity to community organizations and First Nations in BC. And to that end, we provide about 4,000 hours of pro bono legal services uh, each year. And uh, it, for, again, if you are involved with an organization and would like some assistance on a legal issue, please do um, approach us for some assistance. Our work on mining has really spanned the entire time that we've been in existence, but we noticed over the last decade that we were increasingly almost every term doing one or two projects on mining, and each of them are always entirely discrete. So one would be, for example, working with Bev and making submissions to the expert review panel after the Mount Pauli mine disaster. And then a few years later, supporting the lawyer who lay the charges under provincial law in her name against the company. Uh, we've also supported the Chilcot National Government's lawyers several times in opposing the prosperity mine and the destruction of Fish Lake as a tailings pond and also crafted submissions in opposition to the Ajax mine based on water quality issues. So we get organizations from across BC coming to us for assistance, but there's no cohesion or coming together to look at this from a systemic perspective. So we've long been aware that mining is sort of the last untouched legal regime dealing with the environment. And in many ways, we're still in the 1800s with our regulatory design. And because of this, continually working on discrete projects, we really saw the need to pull it all together into a comprehensive look at mining and the law reforms that were needed. So uh, from 2016, or sorry, from uh, 2018 to 2020, we partnered with Mining Watch Canada and Fair Mining Collaborative with the support of First Nations women advocating for responsible mining and Northern Confluence. And we did a, a multi-year project on creating this uh, mining law reform platform, which is what you can see up on your screen right now. And so if you go to reformbcmining.ca, you can find these, I think they're called the reports, but these are the elements of uh, comprehensive mining law reform for British Columbia. And the this project really had two and uh, two parts of it. The first was the platform and then the second was to create or to coalesce the BC mining law reform network. So in terms of the platform, uh, what you'll see in front of you are the eight shorter platforms that have 69 recommendations for reforming BC mining. And it's really intended to be the comprehensive long game for mining law reform and to be systemic. So it's not opposing one waste permit application or a new mine 
uh, but it's really intended to be read as sort of a full platform for how we explore for site operate and close or reclaim mining uh, extraction in British Columbia. So I draw your attention to the two, to two platforms specifically. One is on Indigenous governance and mining, and which explores the conditions necessary for pre prior and informed consent. And the other one is on waste disposal and management. And in the waste disposal and management platform, there are eight recommendations. Uh, which I'll just quickly read to you. We've had, they, they mirror in some way what's been discussed and it'll be interesting to go back to them in light of the new guidelines, the safety first guidelines and to see whether they uh, match up. So the first is to establish a comprehensive plan to safely retire at least 60 active mine tailings dams as recommended by the government's expert panel. Number two, prohibit wet tailings impoundment unless it can be demonstrated through a risk assessment process that wet tailings impoundment poses less long-term risk. And when we, when we talk about risk, it's environmental, financial, and public safety risk than a dry tailings import, uh, approach. Recommendation three is where wet tailings impoundments are in use, require dry closures, such as draining, when mining operations cease, unless it can be demonstrated through a risk assessment process that long-term maintenance of a wet tailings impoundment poses less risk. Recommendation four is to ensure that public safety, environmental safety, and economic safety are the determining factors in governing what tailings disposal systems are implemented. Number five, require that financial feasibility studies conducted for proposed mines and waste disposal systems take into account the full long-term life cycle costs of facilities and include externalities such as long-term costs and risks to the environment, industry, taxpayers, and public safety. Number six, require and apply the strictest and most rigorous standards when tailings dams are unavoidable. Number seven, require that all mines in BC comply with the IRMA standards or better for waste and materials management. And finally, number eight, prohibit disposal of mine wastes into rivers, lakes, and oceans. So this platform is really a broad consensus of a wide variety of organizations and individuals who reviewed these provided comments. So mining law experts, as well as uh, mining engineers themselves, uh, which you can see. So uh, Nikki will navigate to the page of the supporters. And the, the, um, the supporters of this include the First Nations Energy and Mining Council and Salmon Beyond Borders. So the organizers and participants in today's webinar. The second aspect of our project was the, to, to coalesce the BC Mining Law Reform Network. And so this is over 20 organizations in BC who are working on mining. And the intent is to support one another and lend our collective and strategic expertise to issues occurring across the province related to mining. So if you're in that category and have not yet joined the network, please do join off of the BC, or sorry, reformbcmining.ca website. And in that way, we are hoping to uh, push forward on a more systemic approach to mining law reform and addressing mining issues in British Columbia. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Deborah, for that. So I'm going to get all of the uh, speakers to put your videos on so that we can see you all in gallery view and we'll get to some of the questions. There's been some excellent questions that have been posed to date. Um, I think to start with, um, when Alan was talking, there was, uh, he referenced Bill 6, and uh, which is uh, a few both sort of housekeeping changes that are being made to uh, the Mines Act, uh, but also um, is supposed to be addressing the independence uh, unit. And one of the MNLAs reference the av aviation industry, but from what I know, when the av aviation industry has a crash, rules and regulations change almost immediately, or even entire fleets are grounded to improve safety. And I know that, you know, Mount Polly, Brumadino, Smarco, you know, other major tailings disasters seem to be the impetus behind the soon to be released global tailing standard. And yet, you know, change in this sector seems to be really slow. 
uh, to improve safety. And, you know, Dave, you pointed out as well as, as Stephen that, you know, BC is supposed to be having our current inventory and yet there's no action plan there or adopting best available technology. So I'm just wondering if anyone would like to comment or share your thoughts on that or even on the upcoming global tailing standard about to be released next week. Uh, I, I don't mind commenting on the uh, upcoming global industry standard on tailings management. Um, um, of course, I haven't seen the standard because it has not been, it's not being released until next week, not until August 5th. Um, I did study the draft very carefully and I made comments on the draft and of course many, many people did. Um, so I don't mind saying a bit about how our document is or is not similar to the global industry standard. Um, if I could start off with um, the very first sentence in the preamble of the draft of the Global Tating Standard, this standard strives toward the ultimate goal of zero harm to people and the environment and zero tolerance for human fatality, which is exactly what we say. Okay, so we're starting from the same starting point, um, which is excellent. Okay, the question is, um, um, how do, where, where do we go from there and how serious are we about this requirement? Um, our aim in writing this document was to take existing guidance documents and, and in essentially all circumstances choose the most conservative that is the most protective of all of those documents. Um, when I read the draft of the Global Tailing Standard, I mostly had the impression that they took existing guidance documents and asked what did they all have in common? That is, what was the least common denominator? Not 100%, but more or less, okay? And, and it wasn't clear from there exactly how is that a way to move forward by just asking what are our minimum areas of agreement. And, and I also was disappointed, at least in the draft, that there was so little mention of actually um, requirements for engineering in, in construction. Um, and to say the most important things that come to mind right now is... Um, the draft of the Global Tailing Standard did not set minimum requirements for distances between dams and downstream communities. Um, it did not call for an end to the construction of upstream dams. Um, it did not call for a transition from wet tailings to filter tailings. Um, so, so in that way, I see our document as being much more protective of, of people and the environment. Great. Thanks, Stephen. And Jan, I don't know if you also want to comment. Um, there's been a couple of questions about what the what you see as the sort of vision or use of these guidelines and uh, could it be an organizational or community tool uh, to somehow? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for those questions. I think you all are thinking along the lines that we are. So I think the way that we're looking at this document for now is getting these guidelines out and understood and um, sharing information that so that um, everyone has access to them. And then there will be kind of a phase two in which we are hoping to engage with communities and understand how these guidelines can be useful on a local level. And Alan, I appreciated in your presentation, um, you talked about holding public representatives accountable. Um, and we're hoping that these guidelines can be used to help um, hold public representatives accountable. Uh, one interesting example from the release of the guidelines is that um, organizations in Spain that have been um, organizing around new and abandoned uh, tailings facilities uh, put the guidelines out and they were picked up by a local political party that was running for regional elections in Spain and incorporated into the plat their platform. So um, we hope that these guidelines can be useful and applicable in many ways, and we want to continue to work with communities to adapt them um, to fit everyone's needs or the, the needs of the best we can. Great, thanks. Um, and then I don't know if this is uh, both for, for Bev, Alan, and Deborah maybe, but uh, someone asked, what is the role of social license in operating a new mine? Or silence. <laughs> um, Nikki, the way I would kind of respond to that is this way, is to say that, that um, all British Columbians should be concerned about pollution of our significant 
waterways. These waterways um, in, like I, I participated in transboundary First Nation um, dialogue and we have in fact issued a declaration stating that pollution of water is, is the serious concern in British Columbia and the impact to the wild Pacific salmon stocks is, forced, is uh, moving them towards an endangered species. So we have significant concerns around those. The idea that projects, as you can see, projects that move ahead, such as the, such as the LNG, such as the um, Trans Mountain Pipeline and the Site C Dam are moving ahead without uh, First Nations support uh, that we believe is required. And um, as a result of that, you see a lot of uh, social unrest and a lot of legal actions occurring. I do believe that other British Columbians feel like First Nations do. And these, um, but we need, there's not the same ability for them to raise it at a government to government level that First Nations are bringing it forward. But I do think we got to figure out how to get the general public voice heard in a more succinct way on um, trying to deal with the idea of social license. And I might just add that the, the concept of social license has been something in the forefront of industry consideration since before 2000. So, you know, we're well over 20 years, but um, I think there's a real difference between uh, the, the concept that's discussed and how social license is expressed in practice. For example, uh, one of the projects that I've worked on for a number of years now is the Pebble Mine in Alaska. And it's very clear that the people of the region don't want that mine. And polling indicates that a majority of Alaskans the, in the state don't want that mine. But uh, because of the financial power and political pressure that can be brought, um, that mine is still uh, very much uh, a potential. So um, I don't know that you could say that social license is being respected uh, in that regard. Deborah, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to invite us to think, well, I, I think there's very little social license in British Columbia for mining at this point in time. Um, yet it still carries on because there is this, uh, there is this view that mining uh, is a sort of foundational economic driver in our, uh, in our province, which, you know, we're sort of based on hewers of wood and drawers of water. But the reason it can continue is because it continues in a place where we don't see it, which impacts Indigenous communities and the environment very, very fundamentally. I'd love us all, though, to reorient the way we think about mining and reorient it to a demand management approach. So rather than looking for new minerals, we need to encourage our governments and the entire way that the industry is going to reclaim metals. So there's lots of metal out there and we need to develop, we need to pay a whole lot more for it. And we need to also develop the industries for reusing metal rather than constantly going to new sources. And the reason we can go to new sources and why it's cheap and why then new metals go into our iPhones or our cell phones and other, other things or to build large new buildings is because the externalities are put out on the environment. So if we tighten our environmental standards globally uh, that, and also our worker safety, then the whole recycling aspect or the reclaiming aspect of minerals becomes a lot more, um, or metals, I mean, becomes a, a whole lot more uh, viable. Thanks, Beth. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I agree with Deborah. I keep telling mining companies they need to go and mine in garbage dumps before they go to pristine areas. And um, I think, you know, the whole issue of social licenses, you know, the government supposedly um, looks after our interests, but 
they're they're responsible yeah i mean you know they push mining and at the same time try to act as the watchdogs and i think anywhere there's supposed to be a mine i mean look look at um um you know the so Cotin, you know, in their territory, how long they've had to fight to keep that mine out of their territory, you know, and it, I think they probably, you know, that mine is probably still going to try to push something in, in the years to come. I, I don't think they'll, they've given up. But we, you know, it, social license is never going to exist as long as the people in the area aren't part of the decision-making process. And it always amazes me how people in Ottawa or people in Victoria can claim to know what's best for the area when, when they don't live there. They're not on the land. They don't see the changes. And so for me, social license is not going to exist until the people in the area, that's the Indigenous people and the other people, are a part of uh, that decision-making process. Great, thanks everyone. Um, now for, uh, I, I don't know if this will be the last question we get to, but um, so I'm gonna chunk three of them together. So someone asked, you know, how long does it typically take for closed tailing facilities to be safe? And I think this is a good question too, because a lot of mines in British Columbia are under care and maintenance for years and years and years and don't really officially close. So, um, how long does that typically take? And uh, also if anyone has a couple of tips for effective strategies for restoration, and as well if uh, somebody from the technical side could just address um, how filtered tailings protect acid mine or deal with acid mine drainage. Uh, how about if Dave takes the closure and then I'll talk about acid mine drainage. Closure's a tough one, you know, to judge when it's it's been done properly because that always involves a degree of monitoring. And as Steve mentioned uh, in his presentation, uh, ideally you design a mine so that you can walk away from it and it doesn't need any maintenance and doesn't need any monitoring. But but in reality, that doesn't happen. Um, if you look at uh, tailings dam accidents, uh, most of those occur while the mine is operating. And there are a number of reasons for that, but fundamentally you can look at the fact that the, the dam is still being built, the facility is still being built. And then once the mine closes, uh, it's completely built, it's had a chance to stabilize whatever. So we see fewer failures after closure but you know we still don't have a good track record on these things we the industry has basically been using tailings dams for up to 100 years and in in geologic terms which is what these facilities have to be stable for that's nothing so we've still got a lot to learn uh, okay thanks dave okay okay so there's a question about uh connection between um uh, filter tailings and, um, and acid mine drainage. Uh, just so everyone knows what we're talking about, let me first explain acid mine drainage. Um, so you have sulfide minerals below the surface, and when they're during mining, they're brought to the surface, they're crushed, they're exposed to oxygen, uh, they will oxidize and they will uh, convert the sulfur in the sulfide minerals um, into sulfuric acid. And in many cases, this has had very far reaching environmental damage, okay? So one way to present, prevent acid mine drainage, it doesn't work completely, but one approach to that is to keep the tailings always covered with water, okay? Uh, for example, that's the plant at the Mirador mine in Ecuador. Uh, the tailings are covered with water and the plan is that they will be covered with water in perpetuity, okay? Now, in our document safety first, we are arguing the time for that has passed, okay? And that also was said in the expert panel reports on Mount Polly, that it is no longer acceptable to maintain surface water on top of tailings. That is simply a recipe for disaster, okay? Tailings should be filtered. That is, they should be unsaturated. They should have no water cover, okay? That means that if you want to prevent acid mine drainage, you have to do it in another way, okay? But keeping the tailings covered is no longer an option. 
okay? Um, how you can prevent acid mine drainage um, is a, a big topic to explain right now, okay? If someone um, on the webinar wants to talk about this for a particular mine, I'm very happy to discuss that. But certainly the root cause is you minimize the production of tailings that have a high sulfur content, okay? Uh, just to name two things, there's a technology called ore sorting, where the ore is crushed into bite-sized pieces. It's examined with x-rays or other technologies to ascertain its elemental con uh, content. Uh, if it's too high in sulfur or it's too, um, um, it's too low in the mineral value, it simply is not processed at all. So you never produce the tailings that are high in sulfur. Um, another approach is um, in the, or pro in the uh, mineral processing plant, uh, to put as maximum amount of sulfur into the concentrate as possible, so that is simply shipped off site. Um, anyway, that's just a start, okay? It's simply a water okay. cover prevention of acid mine drainage is no longer uh, best available technology. Great, thank you so much, Stephen, for that. And um, and I think too, uh, just on a on another front, in terms of the the closed tailings, uh, um, as Alan mentioned, you know, the idea of indigenous guardians too, and people out monitoring the land regularly is also a key important role and recommendation. Um, so we're coming up to the top of the hour. So I just wanna thank all the speakers so much and to everyone who attended and is concerned about tailing safety. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Environmental Law Center and Earthworks, uh, First Nations Women Advocating for Responsible Mining, Northern Confluence, Mining Watch, Salmon Beyond Borders and the BC Mining Law Reform coalition for sponsoring this webinar. Um, there is an action for those interested to call on the BC government to reduce risk to communities and watersheds by putting safety first in tailings design and management. I think Jamie shared that around on the chat. Um, and uh, yeah, just to close, I think, you know, we all recognize the need and urgency for a low carbon future, but you know, it can't be done on the back of bad mining practices. And in BC, we have plenty of examples from historical legacies like Britannia to ongoing ones like Tulsa Chief or Tech Selenium leaching in the Elk River to more recent ones like uh, Banks Island Gold and the Mount Polly disaster, which is having its sixth anniversary date in a few days. So we are not only can, but I think must do better and uh, to reduce the risk to watersheds and communities. So thanks everyone and onwards.